sing together our opening hymn, Hymn 700, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. <laughs> worship. I thank the Lord that you're here. We remember in the blessings of our baptism as we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts and meditations of our minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. While assured of God's great mercy, let us confess together that we, by our heedless thoughts, careless words, and loveless deeds, have sinned against our gracious God and deserve his punishment now and eternally. Almighty God, we repent of our sins in thought, word, and deed. Be merciful to us. And for the sake of Jesus, grant us your forgiveness, so that, as your redeemed people, we may find rest in you, and with refreshed hearts, serve you in time and in eternity. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated for our readings. first reading for today comes to us from Isaiah chapter 53, beginning at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. As we continue through our Jubilee year, this morning's discipleship point deals with Bible study. What place should the Bible have in a disciple's daily quiet time? Because the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament are uniquely inspired revelation of God and the standard of truth in all matters of faith and practice, a portion of each day should be set aside to read, study, and meditate on God's Word. The Bible is to the Spirit what food is to the body. Let's all pray now together. Father God, let this become true in my life, that your word has a place daily in my schedule for meditation and study, for experiencing you, for wisdom, for discipline, and for feeding my spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Will you please stand? The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already 
because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 571, God loved the world so that he gave. seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, show of hands. How many of you are a little bit nervous about how the sermon will go this morning? Thank you. I appreciate your honesty. Yeah, right? You may not be worried about uh, the next 15 minutes of your life, but I'm going to call your bluff if you tell me that you never worry. And I'm going to be a little uh, concerned about your honesty if you didn't notice that the last two years have had more than their fair share of anxiety-ridden moments. 
Think about everything that we've faced, uh, trying to navigate our way through life with this virus. And now as we're approaching, Lord willing, what is the uh, tail end of this pandemic, and if we turn on the news, they're telling us, get ready for World War III. I can report to you that as anxious as this affair has been uh, for many of us, all you needed to do was step into a school building uh, during this time to realize just how anxious anxious can be. As the adults on duty uh, went about their work and walked up and down the hall, staring at these beautiful little faces that they were responsible for, not always knowing what the best way was uh, to keep them safe while at the same time getting endless direction from the adults in charge who uh, in all likelihood haven't been in a school in many, many years. I was talking to somebody about this the other day and reflecting on the fact that one one good thing uh, that has come from the pandemic was that the fear of the virus completely replaced the fear of outside intruders. Uh, If you've worked in a school, you know what I'm Uh, talking about right before this virus, we were all scrambling to do everything we could to protect the children on the inside from the people on the outside. Uh, We were meeting regularly with local law enforcement. We were uh, meeting with contractors trying to figure out how to uh, best secure our facility. We were having the kids go through all these drills, and we were getting endless recommendations, again, from people who likely had not been to school in quite some time. Yet during the pandemic, we were told that the threat was now located inside our building, and it was invisible. Uh, Good luck with that. How many times in the last couple years have you wondered, how is this all going to end? How is this all going to end? For me, the not knowing what comes next and not knowing how long we're in this current situation, that was what was eating at me all the time. And today I want to suggest that this is the way that many people, even people of faith, view their lives. They're haunted by the question, how is this all going to end? We have this morning in our gospel lesson the most beautiful words ever given. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Greatest story ever told, told in just 26 words, referred to as the hope diamond of Scripture. Uh, Spoken more succinctly, it is simply this, God loves God gives, we believe, we live. Today what I want to make sure you hear is that God has accomplished his mission in Jesus. And while God is still working in this world this day, seeking and saving the lost, it is most certainly at this point mission accomplished. The cross offers for us finality and sufficiency, meaning the cross is where God's mission was accomplished, and the cross offers complete victory. Therefore, our salvation is not the cross plus anything else. It is not the cross plus your good behavior. It is not the cross plus our unique accomplishments. Salvation has been won for us. Jesus went to the cross. Period. And yet there are so many people, people very close to us, people we know who identify as being uh, devoutly Christian, who are still walking around today as if nobody has told them that God wins. It's right here in John 3.16. Game over. God has, God has won. So how can we still wonder if we have done enough to be saved? How come we're still counting up the number of good things we've done uh, versus the number of bad things that we've done? 
how can we still wonder if God is merciful enough merciful enough to save even us out of the mouth of Jesus God loves God gives we believe we live it reminds me of the story of the uh, nervous newlyweds you've probably heard this before uh, the one in which uh, she calls her uh, fiance at work and she's sobbing into the phone she tells him you need to get home right away he's alarmed he says what's what's the matter dear she said i i have been working on this puzzle all day and i can't get it to come together he says well, well what's it supposed to be he says, what do you mean, what's it supposed to be? How should I know? He says, well, well look at the box. He says, oh, the box. Yeah. He looks at the box. He says, oh, it's, it's supposed to be a tiger. And he says, sweetheart, take the pieces, put them back in the box, and put the box back in the cupboard. And she says, why would I do that? And he says, because those are the frosted flakes I bought you yesterday. the point is this sometimes we're living life like we're people trying to solve a puzzle that doesn't even exist we really could take heart though because we're not alone in this right that hope diamond of scripture we're talking about is in Jesus way of in trying to solve this puzzle for a man by the name of Nicodemus Nicodemus you'll remember he is chief among the Pharisees. He is a distinguished church official who came to see Jesus because he's got questions on his heart that he needs to ask him. As Nicodemus begins with some pleasantry, saying to Jesus that it is clear to his eyes that Jesus truly is from God, and Jesus brushes aside all those pleasantries, and he begins the conversation with a bold declaration. He says to him, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. This is a puzzle for old Nicodemus. He's a revered scholar of the law, meaning there's no doubt if we were to open our Bibles and look at the first five books of Scripture, Nicodemus has all those right up here. He knows them word for word. And yet... While he knows everything that God commands, he isn't sure how a person uh, should receive this second birth that Jesus is describing. He can't uh, recall a commandment. He can't think of a custom or a tradition. He can't pinpoint anything that would earn a person this new birth that Jesus is talking about. Finally, in frustration, Nicodemus asks Jesus, is this really to be taken literally? Are you really talking about a man re-entering his mother's womb? Jesus tells him that this second birth, this comes from the Holy Spirit. This born-again new life is all about what God is doing, not what we're doing. It's all about this Holy Spirit who has come to us through our baptism, who come to, comes to us again every time we receive the Lord's Supper. And this Holy Spirit who is attached to every word of Scripture that you will ever hear. This Holy Spirit who is all about creating faith in Jesus. Allowing us to truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, our Savior. That we may receive this new life. Giving us a new life that is for today and a new life that goes on into eternity. This new life is the recreation that the creator of the world is all about. It's the recreation that's first announced at Christ's baptism. Jesus explains to Nicodemus that new life comes. New life comes when the Son of Man is lifted up. He's trying to point him to this future happening Jesus' own 
crucifixion so that he may understand this is the purpose for which Jesus has come into the world and that this lifting up is for the salvation of the whole world not simply a select few he explains to Nicodemus that all those who look to the cross and see Jesus there as their savior they replace their condemnation for new life walking in a new light trying to explain to Nicodemus that there is no puzzle. That the puzzling comes when we're trying to solve something that God has already solved for us. And yet we acknowledge at times we walk around like a bunch of people trying to piece together a box of frosted flakes. Recently I had the opportunity to go visit a man who said to me, I'm not a religious guy, Pastor. But I have a lot of thoughts about God. And he began with a whole bunch of questions that had been weighing on him. Uh, most of his questions I would characterize as uh, trying to understand how God's church can at times be so flawed. He talked about well, why so many uh, different denominations and how uh, people of Scripture can go in so many different directions. He talked about a lot of the things that he believed we should and need to do. Uh, and he explained that these things were weighing on his heart now, especially as his health was failing. I did the best I could to comfort him and to answer his questions to the best of my ability, to point him in the right direction. But before I left, I simply said to him, John 3.16, if your time is short, if your questions are many, Hold on to it with both hands. For God so loved the world. And there are many, many beautiful things found in Scripture. But if we only had these words, this John 3.16, we would still have enough. Everything that we need. There's a warning found in the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. It's repeated again in the book of Revelation in the New Testament that tells us this. It says, don't add anything to or take anything away from God's word. Just like we shouldn't be people who are spending all sorts of time and energy trying to fix things that aren't broken. It's realizing that it's uh, total foolishness to live life trying to solve something that God has already solved. The mission of God is accomplished in Jesus. And while God's story goes on today, and in his uh, mercy and in his grace it includes you and it includes me the ending has already been determined because God so loved the world because he loved it so much he sent his only son so that all who believe in him may trade condemnation for life everlasting therefore the faithful life the life that we are all called to live is not about running around frantically trying to solve everything. It's not even about running around frantically trying to save everyone. Instead, the faithful life is to see our role as messengers sent to declare God's salvation through the things that we say and the things that we do knowing that Jesus was sent into the world to save it. And at the cross, he did. We are sent into the world today to declare mission accomplished. Amen. Would you please join me as we share together common confession of our faith as found in the creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our moment of offering this day, I just want to keep us in our gospel lesson, because in John 3.16, we have the reason behind God's actions in this world, and the reason, quite simply, is God's love, his unfailing love for his creation. I want to encourage us that in all our giving, it is our love response back to God. Yesterday, uh, many gathered here in the morning uh, to pick up Easter lilies and deliver them out to our neighbors in Rolling Meadows. Uh, 127 Easter lilies uh, were delivered yesterday, and uh, the responses are already pouring in. I got a note uh, right away from someone who works in another church in the area and said, oh, it must be a mistake. They didn't realize I work in another church, and they gave me this plant. <laughs> And I explain, no, no, we gave you this plant because we are so grateful to be your neighbor. Uh, there was another woman who right away uh, wrote uh, to somebody on staff here and said, you have no idea. You have no idea what the timing of this gift was. She had just gone through the loss of a very close family member, and she said it was just such a blessing to receive this plant and this note. And I just want to remind you, that when we give in this way, we're giving in a way that reflects the love of God. And it's a wonderful thing. I encourage us all to continue to be generous. We continue now with the prayers of the church as we do uh, this day. Uh, we pray for Crystal Lemker uh, on the passing of her father. Uh, Crystal is, is here right now to be with her family. And we just pray for her and her family during this time. We pray uh, for Rachel Keaton. Uh, who goes in for surgery on Monday. Uh, we pray also for Carol, who is a close friend of Helen Willis, who has now been moved to hospice care. We bring these and many others before the Lord, if you'll please join me. close to the heart of God. We offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all in need. Father, we call on you to do a new thing in the church. Free us from paradigms that no longer serve the gospel. Bring forward leaders who imagine fresh ways of doing ministry. Give us courage in the face of challenges and change. Lord, do a new thing in this world. Break barriers that prevent the political enemies from working together for the well-being of all. Make a way for peace and collaboration among the nations. We continue to cry out on behalf of our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Loving Father, do a new thing for all those who suffer. Reveal a path for any who are unemployed or underemployed, for those experiencing homelessness, and for all those who struggle. Comfort those who are grieving and restore those who are sick, especially this day. We pray for Carol. We pray for those in the hospital, for Lori and for Aaron. We pray for
pray for Rachel with her upcoming surgery. We pray for those with their health struggles, for Holly and Dale, for Carl and Audrey, for Carol and Marty, for Dottie and Maddie, for Ali and Eddie and Steve. We pray for those battling cancer, Betsy and Jackie, Beverly and Jennifer, Todd and Damon and Irma, and Robert and John. We pray for those who are mourning. Especially this day, we pray for Crystal and her family. And we call out to you now with the names of those on our heart. Lord, do a new thing even in our death. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who have attained the prize of their heavenly call. Accept the prayers that we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need and for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will you please stand? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and a praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we may be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do 
this in remembrance of me. Same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you've given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'd like to share just a few announcements with you. First is this, uh, tomorrow evening in the cafeteria at 6.30 is uh, the next get-together for Project Forget Me Not. If you're unfamiliar with this, it's an opportunity to come together. We make cards. Uh, these cards are delivered delivered to local nursing homes. They're also given to those who are sick or shut in. Uh, so if you have any interest in this, this is an all-ages activity. Uh, we would love to have you at 6.30 in the cafeteria. Also uh, wanted to make sure you knew that next Saturday is our next Young at Heart event at 3 o'clock, also in the cafeteria, and that this Wednesday is our uh, last midweek Lenten service. So join us at 6 in the cafeteria to eat, 7 o'clock here for worship. Uh, we are still actively recruiting uh, volunteers for both Easter Jam and the next new sale coming up. So if you are just looking for something to do, have we got a deal for you. Now will you please stand as we sing together our closing hymn. That hymn is 560, Drawn to the Cross. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. You will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you.